The crisp sound of a flipping page broke the perfect stillness of Albedo's office as she perused the latest report to arrive at her desk. A half dozen binders were arranged in a row before her, each containing well over 200 pages. The report itself, or rather, the study, was contained within a binder of its own. The rest were the source materials referenced within. Normally, voluminous amounts of data were sorted and compiled by the elder liches she had painstakingly trained for the Sorcerer's Kingdom's administration. This study, however, contained data that was indecipherable to the undead servitors. Its length aside, it wasn't a common thing to receive information that the Sorcerer's Kingdom's undead administrators could not process. The vast majority of their work was what one might call bookkeeping or accounting dash dealing with mountains of mundane tasks that were time-consuming rather than complex. Management decisions were limited to what was prescribed by Albedo or others both qualified and authorized to act as the middle management of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. Submissions by the nobility had certain quirks to them, something that appeared to be deeply ingrained in how they communicated both with their superiors and with one another. Each was structured as a form of discourse or correspondence, conveying complexities beyond what was possible through forms and conventional reports. The efficiency by which those complexities were conveyed depended on the qualities of the individuals involved, but each noble of the sorcerer's kingdom delivered them with a unique voice. It all spoke of the way that their society was structured, while it might be said that all humans formed bonds with others, nobles were creatures that epitomized this trait. Every submission was a communion of thoughts and values crafted to create, reinforce and deepen social connections. Albedo suspected that the nobles had settled on this mode of communication precisely because they thought it would better help their new prime minister understand both themselves and their subjects. By summer, they were all resorting to written correspondences. She couldn't say that they didn't succeed in their objective, but she cared very little about reciprocating their efforts with correspondences of her own. All she wanted was the crucial data that they presented which would assist in her governance of the realm. The latest offering provided a wealth of information that would be undoubtedly useful, but, at the same time, she couldn't help but be a bit surprised at how well the tool that she had deployed worked. Like an arrow loosed from a bow, it not only flew unerringly at its target but managed to hit nearly every other target along the way. There was also a degree of annoyance over the fact that the tool had to be borrowed. Empire in chains, she muttered. These nobles are becoming audacious. That's a good thing, is it not? The other figure in the room said, Bold leaders with bold ambitions make for excellent agents of change. It would be better if they were agents under our complete control. Ma, you should know that it works better this way. Well, considering the work in Rias ties. Reclining on the chair across from her in his mustard yellow uniform was the area guardian of the guild treasury of the great tomb of Nazarick, Pandora's actor. He held a copy of the study open in a long-fingered hand and seemed a bit more than proud that the seed he had planted had grown so rapidly over the past year. That is exactly my point, Albedo suppressed a sigh. The vermin there are audacious to the point of presumptuousness. Whenever I think of... An uncontrollable shudder went all the way to her wingtips and her hand went to where she had been violated. If there was a way to tear off her skin to make it so that she had never been touched, Albedo would have gladly done so. She should have demanded that he be mulched and replaced with a doppelganger. Their insolent pawn had grown problematic to the point where he had been isolated to his territory. There, Hilma Signaeus assured her that he would be rendered harmless. Two handlers were assigned to watch over him and bring him out only when his presence was required at one noble function or another. At any rate, she smoothed out her feathers, it only goes to prove that an adequate degree of oversight is necessary if any of these outsiders is to be granted real authority. Speaking of oversight, something is off about your agent in Rias ties. The princess, or the prostitute? The princess. The prostitute is already ruined. Any concerns over her are ultimately short-lived. That was true enough. Hilma Signeus would never be any more than what she was. She would be squeezed for what little she was worth and cast aside when they were done with her. Have you heard something as moment? What I haven't heard is the problem. Pandora's actor crossed his legs and gestured vaguely into the air. I understand that her proposal to treat Rias ties as an area appeals to our sensibilities, but this plan that she is enacting is indicative of problematic thinking. That human is fundamentally at odds with the core of what we are. So he was aware of it as well. By putting together bits and pieces from external sources, no less. Simply put, 
Princess Rena did not trust anyone and her motives were inherently selfish. This was the polar opposite of Nazarick's NPCs, who were created to serve and implicitly trusted one another. As long as we hold power over her heart's desire, Albedo replied, she can be reliably used. The same cannot be guaranteed for these seeds that you've planted. While they may have been planted by me, Pandora's actor said, they have been mostly nurtured by others. Even Ein Summer has involved himself in the process of transforming them into the first batch of qualified agents. The doppelganger stopped gesturing to pat the binder in his hand, the work of one such tool. Albedo looked back down at her copy, idly running her gaze over the open page. Only a fool would attempt to refute his statement. Pandora's actor had invested a great deal of effort in determining how to mold the citizens of the Sorceress Kingdom into components that served in the machinery of the state. His findings led to a variety of conclusions that were both promising and potentially problematic. To the denizens of Nazarick with their unending lifespans, the workings of the mortals under their rule could be seen as a curious game in itself. Each piece lived brief lives and their task was to make the most out of those brief lives. Education and guidance, or rather, standardization and brainwashing, served as an effective means to mass-produce individuals who embarked upon the job class paths that their handlers desired. If they produced a faulty component, all they had to do was wait for them to die. Or justify their disposal. Many advocated that failed individuals should just be reprocessed to free up resources. However, the lines that the Supreme One had drawn concerning the governance of the Sorceress Kingdom essentially prohibited this. Some of those components, however, were now starting to produce results and reveal aspects of the world that would by necessity change the Sorceress Kingdom's plans as well. Do you truly believe that this emphasis on culture merits the investment of our time and resources? Indeed, I do, Pandora's actor nodded. What we have discovered concerning the mechanics of this world make its effects irrefutable. Unlike Yggdrasil, where everything is known and set in stone, everything evolves here. Even if we do not deepen our understanding of these systems and exploit them to our ends, someone else inevitably will and they may potentially gain advantages over us. The task of managing the mortals of this world is well suited to we who can cultivate their potential over the course of eons. Potential, Ein Summer has warned of the dangers that come with knowledge. Only those who display absolute loyalty to Nazarick are allowed to share in its fruits. What is allowed to the rest is limited to what we deem harmless. Oh, I do not disagree, but several of the people that we speak of are as loyal as a native of this world can be short of casting domination magic on them. They are loyal nobles, Albedo noted. Loyal nobles are loyal to the contracts that they maintain with their liege. It was perhaps a strange distinction to make considering that the sovereign of the state was Momonga Summer, yet a crucial one all the same. The citizens of the Sorceress Kingdom, nobles included, were generally unaware of the fact that the Sorceress Kingdom was in truth a front for Nazarick. They believed that they were citizens of a kingdom that had certain differences from the one that they had come from but was still largely something that they were familiar with. Those exposed to the truth of the Sorceress Kingdom reacted in one of two ways. The first was that they would enter a state of fearful subservience that produced individuals of limited and specific use. The second was that they would understand their place and show the appropriate gratitude for being allowed to exist. Save for a handful of exceptions, humans tended to fall into the first category. You believe that they will change if exposed to the truth? Pandora's actor tilted his head cradling his chin between his thumb and forefinger. All of them are already aware of bits and pieces of it. The workings of the Sorceress Kingdom are such that certain things are not so easy to conceal. Furthermore, the gradual approach to their transition has been taken precisely because they are not only individuals of proven talent, but also because their nature is compatible with ours. Time only proves this ever more to be the case. Inserting this agent into your experiment with the Empire far exceeded the minimum thresholds for success, no? Was there such a thing as getting more than what one wanted, yet being unsatisfied that one had? Despite being what all agreed to be a resounding success in their efforts to create useful agents out of the world's natives, something still irritated her about the whole affair. The basic test for the agent had several conditions to clear. Abusing her authority as a representative of the Sorceress Kingdom was an instant fail and grounds for termination. Demonstrating competence in the role that she had been groomed to fill was also required to pass. 
She was to facilitate the integration of the Death Series servitors but failure or success at her other tasks as a liaison officer did not constitute an overall failure so long as she endeavored to carry out her duties in good faith. No one expected her to just barely manage, but neither did anyone expect her to help achieve over 80% of the secondary and bonus objectives that were identified but not disclosed. The Empire was made to better know its place, understand that they could not survive the dangers of the world without the Sorceress Kingdom and had taken the first steps to align their legislation with their suzerain's foreign policy. This was done without extinguishing imperial ambitions, instead refining them to serve as a better geopolitical tool for the Sorceress Kingdom. Of immediate importance to Albedo were the imperial policies currently undergoing deliberations, policies concerning non-human races and tribal relations. With the subjugation of the Abelian Hills came a fresh influx of non-human subjects to the Sorceress Kingdom. The Empire's efforts would serve as a testing ground for how human-centric societies could be phased into the multiracial society that their master desired. Their master's shrewd acquisition of Peri Euro and the arrangements to have him encounter Emperor Jerkniv served to catapult her plans forward. Albedo would be unqualified as Momonga Summer's right hand if she didn't further capitalize on his generous assistance. While it would be a few years before the other human countries in the region would come under their direct influence, it would take time to collect data and develop a working template for their conversion into states that fell in line with the Sorceress Kingdom's policies. Perhaps it is because we don't have many of them yet. Albedo looked up from her thoughts. Pandora's actor quietly awaited her response, regarding her with his egg-like face. I beg your pardon? A line exists between those of Nazarick and everyone else he explained, but outsiders are beginning to approach that line as of late. They can never step over it to become one of us, but, at the same time, they have created a new line for us to observe. Before the Sorceress Kingdom, the beings that existed in that space were products of indulgence, curiosities, experiments or something like pets. Now, we have a new breed of outsider that has been imparted a degree of authority and responsibility that may be perceived as infringing on the duties that we have been created to fulfill. Pandora's actor leaned back in his seat and crossed his arms, looking up at the wall past her left shoulder. I believe we are all experiencing some discomfort due to this. Jealousy, if you will. Jealousy? Albedo's smile slipped off of her face, what is there to be jealous of these inferior lifeforms about? The same things that we are always jealous about, Pandora's actor shrugged. Whenever someone performs some service for Iron Summer, we think ah, I wish that could have been me. When someone serves in a role that we, too, might have served, we imagine how well we could perform and the bliss we would experience in their place. As created beings, we always strive to do more, we would grind ourselves to dust just to grasp a tiny bit of that supreme satisfaction. Whenever others are entrusted with important tasks, there is a tiny voice in each of us that screams thief. And so you propose to increase the number of thieves? No. I am saying that only having a few makes their achievements seem overly special dash especially since they require intelligence and talent to accomplish. Rationally speaking, this shouldn't be so since we are the ones assigning duties to them. Having more of these individuals will better define what is to be truly envied and what is to be perceived no differently than how you would view an elder lich delegated to administrative tasks. You're trying to soften me up for the next one, aren't you? As Albedo peered at him. Pandora's actor brought down his hat to hide his face. His muffled voice rose from behind it. Maybe. She snorted and rolled her eyes. Unlike Baroness Saradnik, she said, Countess Corlin is both logical and plans thoroughly ahead of time. We have been collaborating closely on her initiative, amongst other things, since last spring. So I've heard, Pandora's actor placed his hat back on his head again. From what I can gather of her, the good countess has an overwhelmingly positive sense of respect and admiration for her prime minister, as well. Birds of a feather, perhaps? I wouldn't go that far, Albedo scoffed. She and I both understand our respective positions and her excellence was apparent once she assumed the duties that came with her title. Yet, you did not voice a single word of protest when Shiltir gobbled her up. Shiltir's duties are far more expansive and complicated than she can handle alone with elder liches and vampire brides, she told him. It was a necessary staffing arrangement and Ein Summer approved her request. Besides, her transfer under Shiltir's authority does not affect her other work. Pandora's actor rose from his chair, 
his slender fingers moving to tug at the lapels of his uniform. In that case, he said, may I take this to mean that you'll give your final approval on her great venture? It's just the first step of her great venture, but yes. Then I will see you at the next court meeting, the doppelganger's form shifted, his uniform replaced by jet black plate, as Momen, of course. Albedo's amber gaze followed Pandora's actor as he made his exit. Once the tall door clicked shut, she closed the binder containing Baroness Zirodnik's report and relaxed in her seat. Great venture, huh? If one was to summarize the moves that Nazarick had made with respect to the Sorceress Kingdom, they could be described thusly. First came the acquisition of a key territory that acted as the nexus of the region and would serve as a compact seat of power, Eranthal. To the west of Eranthal were all of their efforts that might be described as subversive or belligerent. Eastwards were the efforts that would be described as benign or benevolent. To the northeast was the Empire, which acted as a test model for a stable and orderly human state. In the Azalizia Mountains to the north was the Dwarf Kingdom, a small, but relatively valuable state that explored the possibilities of having minor, fully autonomous trading partners. The frost dragons that had been picked up along the way were granted to Shiltir and served as the backbone of the Sorcerer's Kingdom's aerial transportation network. There were also the frost giants that came as a sort of bonus and were in the process of creating a navy. They would also serve as marines and the armed forces. In the southwest was the mopping up of Demiurge's farm experiments, which culminated in the selective genocide of tribal populations in the Abelian Hills. Once several dozen side objectives were accomplished and the targeted populations were cleansed, they were left with mostly docile groups of tribal demi-humans who submitted themselves as tributaries to the one who liberated them from Yaldabaoth, the Sorcerer King. Management of the Abelian Hills had been handed to Albedo, and she planned to use it as a testbed for various social and economic experiments. This demi-human genocide also served as a springboard to destabilize and divide the relatively stable and prosperous Holy Kingdom of Roblay, which was situated on the peninsula to the west. The Holy Kingdom was a series of intervention experiments where adverse conditions were forced upon the nation for the Sorcerer's Kingdom to rescue them from. It was also used to test various methods to boost domestic productivity under undesirable conditions by the standards of the native humans. The first phase, a military intervention to save the nation from the demi-human coalition invading them from the Abelian Hills, had recently been concluded. The second phase was a socio-economic experiment that set the stage for a second military intervention. This intervention involved the Sorcerer's Kingdom delivering economic and military aid at the request of Robles Holy King, who was now a doppelganger from Nazarick, to quell civil unrest, purge undesirable elements and restore order to the nation. Once that was done, the Holy Kingdom would not only be ruled by a Nazareth agent but also be unquestionably indebted to its savior, the Sorcerer King. Countess Corlin's opening move to her great venture was the Sorcerer's Kingdom's next experiment, one that tested the viability of its native agents in influencing national affairs on a large scale. Far to the southeast, past the misty wastelands of the Katza Plains, the Countess and her faction would be performing another intervention, one that would bring an entire nation back from beyond the brink of ruin the deliverance of the Draconic Kingdom. Once complete, the Sorcerer's Kingdom would have another scenario's worth of data. Tightly binding their new ally to the Sorcerer's Kingdom's hegemony would also deliver to them a gateway to the continent. And after that? Albedo's eyes glinted in anticipation. After that would be her turn. Everything was going according to plan. Afterward. After many words, we've finally come to the end of Empire in Chains. Acts with largish scale warfare always seem to run long. Thank you once again, dear reader, for your continued interest in Valkyrie's shadow. So what are the chains of the Empire? Going into the volume, it might have been assumed that the title referred to the new relationship between the Baharuth Empire and the Sorceress Kingdom. By now, however, I hope that it is understood that the chains that bind the Empire are for the most part not what comes with its legal status as a client state but those forged by imperial society and its generations of development. These chains exert their effect on people in both good and bad ways. This volume was something of a long-awaited at least for me, exploration of the Baharuth Empire and what makes it tick. The story takes us through many of the topics visited in both the Overlord Light novel and Web novel as an in-depth journey of the reality of the fantasy authoritarian state that many see as the much superior, foiled to the kingdom of Rhea's ties. Piecing together the Baharuth Empire?
The first task in fleshing out the Baharuth Empire is to look at its canonical source, as well as its apocryphal sources. As many may know, the most information about the Baharuth Empire comes from the Overlord web novel where the original route leads to the exploration of the Empire. There, Ainz becomes a Super Marquis dash the Frostfire translation uses Archduke, possibly because there isn't a suitable English equivalent for it, and bumbles his way through Imperial politics, the Imperial Magic Academy and the not-so-pretty realities of the Baharuth Empire. Most of the Imperial Povs in Empire and Chains are characters from the web novel adapted to the light novel's divergent timeline. Historical Inspirations In the western portion of Overlord's fanbase, the Baharuth Empire appears to be most often equated to the Roman Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire Byzantium. In reality, it is neither, it is something like a half-baked Qin analogue from the spring and autumn period of ancient China. Its system is that of Zhou feudalism, which Jerknev solidified in his ascension to Emperor Legion? Knight Brigade? Army Group? I feel like the use of Legion in the English fan translations is the main culprit in the assumption that Baharuth is based on the Western or Eastern Roman Empire. The Japanese text never uses Legion, however, the Empire simply divides the Imperial Army into army groups. The First Legion is actually the First Army Group, and so on. When a group of Imperial Knights are identified performing policing duties in our winter, they are referred to as members of the First Knight Brigade slash Corps slash Order. Maruyama also uses some rather puzzling groupings in the web novel, including the 14-man patrol which you see defined as a squad in Valkyrie's shadow. Army groups are division-sized and battalion-sized units are called divisions, but that's just the way he wanted it to be, I guess. Another culprit that leads to people misidentifying the Baharuth Empire as a Western-based nation is the copypasta architecture in the anime adaptation but the adaptation is so full of inconsistencies that what it portrays probably shouldn't be taken seriously. At least they seem to have fixed some stuff for season 4. One thing that Maru seems to have borrowed from Rome is the Grand Arena, which is essentially the Colosseum complete with gladiators, but it's about the only thing and fighting arenas slash pits are one of those cool things that most fantasy authors add to their stories at some point. Rich Country, Strong Army is mentioned during the Imperial Magic Academy's promotional examination by Fluda Paradine as he describes the driving slogan slash ideology of the Baharuth Empire in the web novel. This is one of the key hints as to what the Baharuth Empire is based on, as it is something that originates from the Warring States period of China. Since then, it has been adopted in modern times by Imperial Japan as well as various political bodies in 19th-20th-21st century China. However, the Empire's government is similar to what one would find in a Warring States nation, something close to early Qin, to be precise. As seen in both Lane and WN, however, the rich part is much like everything else, though glossed over heavily in the Lane while the Empire is doing well as a country, most of the people are not. The four-district system of our winter is dominated by slums and a low-cost suburban sprawl upon which is mounted the crown jewel of the Baharuth Empire. Security arrangements are similarly prejudiced in favor of the affluent. Other cities are at least similar and probably worse, with busy Wood Pishmal noting the horrible conditions that he had to face as a dock worker, which drove him to become an imperial knight. Save for the security provided by the imperial army and the plot convenient lack of powerful people to cause real trouble, their quality of life is identical to their counterparts in Rias ties. Much like Rias ties, the principal measure of labor in the empire is manpower making the vast majority 90% plus, of the empire's population rural and placing hard limits on industrial productivity. Emperor Jerk Niv. Once upon a time, there was an ambitious sovereign who sought to unify a land divided. To do so, he became an autocratic tyrant, rising to power through much bloodshed which included killing his closest blood relatives. He pushed radical reforms at all levels of the state in a broad effort to improve the country. He stripped the nobility of their legal rights and authority. He was a staunch supporter of meritocracy and a champion of legalism, centralizing power into an imperial bureaucracy and actively suppressing old culture and religion. The closest he came to subscribing to any religion was his observance of the elements. Oh, and he had a harem. Does he sound familiar to you? Overlord readers might recognize him as Emperor Jerknev. Historically, this man is Qin Shi Huang the first emperor of a unified China. Emperor Jerkniv is overlords Qin Shi Huang, though in a half-baked fantasy form. 
Maybe he was never meant to be the whole deal since it would have cast him as an evil despot to readers. Canonically, Jerknev never abolished feudalism, simply purging at first the politically inconvenient and then the incompetent. Many loyal imperial nobles remain, though the loyalty of many is simply fearful lip service. The imperial juggernaut was still undergoing reforms at the beginning of Overlord and the Empire was well on its way to unifying the former nation of Reistis, but then Ains happened and now Jerknev is a furry lover. Perhaps this is for the best, as Qin ultimately failed and the Qin dynasty was overtaken by another within a century, restoring culture, religion and the power of the aristocracy. Qin Shi Huang became a man reviled for millennia. Jerkniv's apparent fate of shelving his ambitions is, in my mind, one of the greatest tragedies of Overlord. From shining star to shining scalp, the Baharuth Emperor and his empire seem to have been canonically sidelined in favor of shining the spotlight on Nazarick's achievements without even a drop of accomplishment to spare. Personally, I would like to see him rise again with new ambitions under the auspices of the Sorcerer's Kingdom. As of the post lane segment, however, he is still in his pitiful state of fearful subservience to the Sorcerer's Kingdom from west to east. One of the more curious aspects of the Baharuth Empire is its transition from the Western feudalism of Reistis to the nascent Zhou feudalism of present-day Overlord. Maru Yam appears to recognize that this sort of thing doesn't happen overnight, as the Empire's governmental structures cannot be arbitrarily installed without proper foundations and Jerkniv runs into a brick wall pushing his reforms and restructuring too hard. Instead, this transition occurs over generations, with each emperor phasing in the various institutions required to support the empire's fantasy Joe feudalism. Some of them we know about from the web novel, such as when the Imperial Ministry of Magic and the Imperial Magic Academy are founded. The way honors are awarded and titles are granted and taken away is an imitation of how Joe feudalism's centralized bureaucracy recognized exceptional service. Others require a mental exercise that ties in various tidbits strewn throughout Overlord's content. Some things, however, cannot change so easily so they remain the same. This includes the Empire's people, its Western look, the use of its own version of Reistise's language, art, culture and motifs, and its shared observance of the four elemental gods. The Imperial Army. Effectively a gendarmerie, the way the Imperial Army is deployed is a curious thing. Each army group has its assigned jurisdiction in the empire, functioning as a professional military that provides security against foreign and domestic threats as well as operating in civilian law enforcement. Yet, in Volume 9 of Overlord, six army groups are deployed to the Battle of Katza Plains. How does this work? Each army group is supposed to have 10,000 imperial knights and the empire had 60,000 men at the battle. Do they tell criminals to take a vacation for a few weeks? Do customs and taxation cease to exist? Do the demi-human tribes all around the empire take a collective holiday because they aren't being suppressed by imperial patrols? There is no concrete answer in canon. It just works. In Valkyrie's shadow, I took the rather nondescript imperial army and turned it into a fully-fledged and functional professional military force equipped to fulfill its role as the shield of the empire. Martial Tradition the Imperial Army of Valkyrie's Shadow takes the traditional root of army development characteristic of our world, which draws from elite aristocratic regiments eventually giving rise to a national institution of professional soldiers. In both the Lane and WN, you can see that the nobility features prominently in the Imperial Army, despite the majority of the army being from common backgrounds. In the WN, every general except for Carbane was either a martial noble or a civilian noble. In the Lane, General Carbane was changed to be a civilian noble. You also have noble fighters serving elsewhere in the armed forces, such as nimble and leaners of the great imperial knights. Exceptional common soldiers do not stay common for long, as they are promoted to the ranks of the gentry. This creates an interesting avenue through which tradition can persevere through a regime that oppresses undesirable cultural elements, resulting in the imperial army possessing an esprit de corps founded on its roots in the martial aristocracy. At first, we see how this serves them well in the Second Legion. Ludmilla fits right and since they, like her, serve as the main line of defense of their nation and share similar values. The shortfalls in this martial culture, however, are made clear when Ludmilla spends time in the Wyvernmark and with General Ray's battalion. With the Sixth Legion, she is able to finally define what she has, up until that point, only partially seen as a deficiency in the Imperial Army. 
For all of its valor and vigilance when acting as the shield of the Empire, the Imperial Army has no idea what it means to go on the offense and Imperial views result in deadly ignorance that is also problematic for the image of the Sorcerer's Kingdom's hegemony. Furthermore, the traditional values of the Imperial Army are severely out of alignment with most of its rank and file as they enter a period of ambitious expansion and development. In the end, the Empire is sent back to the drawing board, realizing that their first foray into the wide world was woefully premature. They've made gains and can still make them, but new policies, doctrines and procedures need to be drawn up if they are to truly leave the nest and enter the world stage. Cultural and Religious Suppression in the Overlord Lane and WN, cultural and religious suppression, as well as the brainwashing propaganda in the Baharuth Empire is generally well received by the readers. I think that this is mostly because it highlights how the aristocracy, a favorite target of Isekai stories, is cast down from power. Also Church Bad TM. Within this narrative are many glossed over or entirely unnoticed aspects that Mariama just loves to stick into Overlord. The Bloody Emperor's Purges of course, a reference to Qin Shi Huang's move to dissolve the old aristocracy of his time. Many seem to assume that Jerk Niv targeted those that deserved it in classic Isekai form, but his first move was to eradicate his siblings, followed by all threats to power. Rather than incompetent, they were competent enough to present a tangible threat to this super genius of an emperor. There are several attainted that are introduced in the WN, such as Fendro's trio, but the only one that makes it into the lane is Arch. Arch is another reference to Qin Shi Huang's oppressive acts of tyranny, a dutiful daughter who exemplifies Confucian ideals of filial piety. As Qin Shi Huang burned books and buried Confucian scholars en masse, so too was Arch, an academic wizard who subscribed to what we would equate Confucian ideals here on earth, buried in Overlord. The backlash for Arch's fate is often derisively pointed to as people simping for the cute blonde girl but it does strike a much deeper chord for those raised in many Asian societies, which are still heavily influenced by Confucian values deeply ingrained into their cultures. On the religious front, the faith of the four is seen as a rival for influence over the hearts and minds of the population and a potential source of rebellion in the Empire in Overlord canon. In Valkyrie's shadow, they are suppressed not only by the secular nature of the Empire but its efforts to minimize its influence to that of the magical healthcare system. Rooting out religious influence is an extraordinarily difficult task, however, and the temples still hold quite a bit of sway in the empire. The Imperial Magic Academy The titular locale of possibly the most hated arc in Overlord, the Imperial Magic Academy is a state organ that grooms the future leaders of the empire as they should fit in the bureaucracy's blueprint for imperial society. Founded by the emperor of two generations previous in the web novel. The Academy has the appearance of a modern-day high school for the elite that veils its cold, utilitarian purpose. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on who you ask, it is not as successful in that purpose as the central bureaucracy would like. Needless to say, its relentless efforts at promoting what the noble quartet see as the groundwork for a flawed society are horrifying to them. This is especially the case since their interest in the institution stems from creating their own academies in the Sorcerer's Kingdom. The deterministic reality of the new world. What happens when you take a serious look at a world with a hard class system, genetics that heavily influence an organism's capabilities relative to other members of the same species and systems of conceptualization that turn ideas into reality? It's not something that's done very often, as far as I know. I've certainly taken a lot of flack for presenting the reality of this reality. However, Empire and Chains can be interpreted as a look at how a nominal meritocracy using Earth-style measures holds up in a deterministic setting. I put meritocracy in quotations because realistically speaking, people would be aware of these other factors and their influence, eventually sciencing it out to create a true meritocracy that works in the new world. The brand of meritocracy that exists in the Baharuth Empire is only possible due to its extremely short history, with everything being wiped clean 200 years previous by the demon gods. There is not enough data and not enough time to sift fact from fiction and superstition. The policies of the empire focus heavily on tangible gains in their national bid for regional power, resulting in lopsided metrics for merit. Worth is determined by those with authority, resources and strength. Everything else is allowed to silently wither and die. Culture and its impact in the new world. 
Despite the amount of criticism that the New World system of fantasy genetics has received from some, culture is the main focus of Empire and Chains and one of the central aspects of kingdom building in Valkyrie's Shadow. Culture is the protocol by which organisms reconcile their biology, including those of non-living beings like the undead, with their environment in aspects which cannot be interpreted properly through biology alone. In our world, this includes understanding technological advancement and how it is perceived and utilized, as well as our perceptions of advanced social dynamics and many artificial constructs such as ideology, politics and economics. Possessing protocols compatible with the times can make everything simple. Incompatibility leads to misunderstandings, highly polarized echo chambers, comically evil exploitation, conflict and chaos. In Overlord, it is of even greater importance as culture is the framework through which a society taps into the conceptualization mechanics of the setting and allows individuals to actualize what has been conceptualized by a society. This applies to the manifestation of job and racial classes, martial arts, magic, spell song, skills, abilities and many of the fantastic elements of the world. Though they are generally much weaker than players, New World natives are capable of doing things far beyond what is possible in Yggdrasil because they can literally create something from nothing and that something is not subject to game balance. The loss of culture and discounting of cultural elements leads to the loss of knowledge and what that culture was capable of conceptualizing. It is a piece of the puzzle of New World civilization that the Empire does not put any stock into, power that they've discarded because it cannot be qualified by their measures. Still, culture is only partially suppressed in the Empire, with what it deems of merit allowed to slowly develop without truly knowing what is going on. The martial culture of the Empire has manifested the Imperial Knight while the work of Freyan Gushmand has identified the Imperial Arcanist, but, because New World natives cannot see class builds, these job classes are considered speculation in the Empire at best and more commonly seen as vocations that anyone can learn. It is difficult to develop skills and abilities for something that one doesn't know exists, so the sterile approach of the Empire severely cripples its advancement as its citizens do not fully harness the power of their job classes. In other fields, Imperial culture flourishes, though not in the way those in House Gushman or House Gran might appreciate. I'm sure Central Administration will eventually manifest some sort of bureaucrat job class if they haven't already done so but the development of that class and what it is capable of will be extremely slow without a lot of luck and radical thinking, which is frowned upon. The Imperial Ministry of Magic's willingness to explore the bounds of magic also presents the potential for interesting things. Ilishnish and a couple of members of the Noble Quartet, however, are very sensitive to culture and its effects on the world. Even so, they still don't have a full grasp on what is going on, it's intuitive, at best. Perhaps with enough examples from other places, they'll finally be able to define these mechanics in practical terms and put them to effective use. This lack of understanding when it comes to the power of culture and recognizing the systems of the world is part of what has Oakley labeled the Empire as a nation of barbarians, a hint at the rude awakening the Empire might face if they go out into the world thinking that they stand at the pinnacle of civilization. Rias ties and Baharuth are frog in a world states, the backwater of the new world in every sense. Job class systems and their effect on culture and society. There is very little in the way of vocational freedom in Overlord. A humanoid becomes an adult and the first job class level they get, they're stuck with. No amount of education, retraining or hard work will change this. Neither will death and resurrection. Those who wish to be the best professionals they can be will have to know what they want from childhood and stick with it for the rest of their lives. Though there is no way for new worlders to know for sure, characters that are aware of the job class system, like Lud Miller, begin to understand how a harsh reality can be for people. The main way for people to screw their job class build is to simply grow up without a framework in which they can make informed choices for their future. That the Empire determines merit through tangible contributions makes the situation for its citizens that much worse. A male spare born to a farming family might have a high aptitude for farming, but the realities of being a spare mean that he must eventually leave the nest as the eldest son inherits the tenancy. When he leaves home, he might have one level in farmer because his family is at least nice enough to let him build up some savings working for them. As he drifts from job to job trying to make ends meet, he might pick up a handful of other job class levels before finally deciding to join the Imperial Army because it pays better and has other attractive benefits. Now, 
A one farmer genius slash one merchant slash one fisherman slash one carpenter might seem impressive to an Imperial Army recruiter because of the stat block that he has about as strong as a level 2 fighter, compared to a level 1 civilian competing for the slot, but that's four non-combat levels eating into his level cap. After a long life of service where he can never seem to obtain any notable achievements, he retires to a farm pension as one farmer genius slash one merchant slash one fisherman slash one carpenter slash eight fighter. At that point, he discovers that he's an exceptionally good farmer and he has burned his life away on things that he's not particularly good at. How bitter is that? Deterministic systems with hard limits flip our Earth-founded values on their heads, creating scenarios where practices disturbing to our sensibilities or economically inferior in our reality actually ensure that people can live productive and hopefully fulfilling lives. Not only that, it's optimal for society as a whole. In the new world, being free to do what you want hurts you and everyone around you unless you happen to win a lottery with astronomical odds. Fantasy Genetics slash Bloodline slash Eugenics re -e -e. This is the one subject that got a crap ton of unexpected attention, considering it's based on Maruyama's setting and is purely fantasy fiction. In the new world, however, it is what it is and it has been proven over and over again. Bloodlines matter, producing superior individuals. Not in our Earth sense of thinking that superficial traits somehow lend superiority over others, but in an extremely decisive sense. Those few player descendants who awaken to their legacy effectively become beings with continent-destroying power. Even those that do not awaken can still become heroes. Vocational aptitudes and lofty level caps can be passed on from generation to generation, as with Naya, Inferior, House Indra, and House Custodio. This phenomenon is not limited to humans. Manifesting a strong bloodline is the difference between being a one-man army and a rank-and-file foot soldier. Even at the common level, it can make a huge difference. More people have the level potential for Tier 3 magic, warriors have the potential for an additional focus level. This affects tiers of crafting and achieving capstone levels in civilian classes as well, determining who can craft with adamantite while everyone else is limited to iron. Taking the poor guy in the job class example above, if he ends up having a family, it will likely be with someone that he met during his long career. Repeat his story with millions of citizens over consecutive generations and you get a genetic melting pot where everyone tends towards the average and bloodlines that manifest strong vocational aptitudes are lost in a sea of randomness. The Baharuth Empire, with its current system of Earth-style meritocracy, screws the nation out of bloodline perks because of their measures of merit. Measures of attraction revolve around success in the form of wealth and general attractiveness which continually sabotages attempts at refining lineages. Because they promote a worldview that does not recognize the inherent value of bloodlines in their world, they are forever playing whack-a-mole trying to find talented and powerful people to employ. As both Lud Miller and Elishnish have noted, the Empire is slowly creating a standard imperial bloodline that reliably produces unremarkable individuals. A powerful being doesn't care about millions of average humans, as they cannot stop that powerful being. What humans need are lineages capable of producing exceptional individuals who can rise to the challenges that the world presents to a nation. While individuals who inherit strong bloodlines can be taught to harness their inherited strength through excellent institutions, bloodlines themselves cannot be taught. There are vestiges of older value systems in the northern human nations, however. People are naturally attracted to the strong while groups like House Gran have a fairly good idea of how it works and have refined their methodologies to the point that they reliably produce third-tier wizards in every generation. People like Pluto 9 Sack even go so far as to give fertility drugs to women in an attempt to secure the next generation of the strong moments children, in Ayn Sack's case. Characters The Noble Quartet Though they went on what was a vacation, the main purpose of the Noble Quartet's visit to the Baharuth Empire is fairly clear, they came to see what a reportedly successful country looked like as a case study for their territorial development in the Sorceress Kingdom. Many lessons, good and bad, were learned and some interesting connections were made. Along the way, they had some fun tag-teaming everyone they ran into. Leanne and Florian were husband-hunting as well, but the waves of a tainted and a certain traumatized nimble dashed their hopes. At least they have every faction in the Empire sending representatives their way after Ludmilla mopped up the groups following Elishnish around. How they apply what they've learned in the Empire is an ongoing story. Because of its lawful and orderly nature and their sense of responsibility as officials from the Sorceress Kingdom, 
The quartet's visit to the Empire is probably the tamest of their visits to any place in Valkyrie's shadow. Everything is about watching, asking questions and learning with very little of the flexing they could potentially do as they have no cause to do so. From a kingdom-building standpoint, however, this trip was remarkably fruitful and they now take the lessons that they've learned back with them to the Sorcerer's Kingdom. Nemel Gran the first Empire side character to interact with a member of the main cast, Nemel Gran is a potato-loving noble scion who serves as a supporting character to Jet Testania in the Overlord web novel. In the WN, her introduction occurs as she is caught up in a Ijania ambush for Einzul Gan. Ironically, she helps Elishnish deliver Ijania to the Sorceress Kingdom in Valkyrie's shadow. Her magical capabilities are simultaneously described in the Jetpuff as having no magic while also being able to easily kill people with her magic. I have no idea what that was supposed to mean, but it got incorporated as part of her humble and unassuming nature. As in the WN, Nemel is portrayed as a nice, helpful girl who goes out of her way to help her friends in this story. In the Lane timeline, the WN Academy's promotional examination is long over and Nemel gets a safe job as a mage in the Imperial Air Service. Instead of being an accessory to Jet, she becomes a primary puff as the traveling companion of the Lisan apostrophe ish equals Verilin as the Frost Dragon Bard investigates the Baharuth Empire for the Ministry of Transportation. While somewhat excitable, Nemel is a reasonably intelligent and reliable girl who is slowly pulled out of her shell of naively optimistic youth by Elishnish. Despite not thinking much of herself, she has a proactive and resilient nature which allows her to reach out and touch the lives of others. Coming from a warm, caring family that is far more than it seems, Nemel is a fundamentally good person who can absorb a lot of emotional baggage and genuinely empathizes with the people she is exposed to. Even Nemel has her limits, however. Though at first turning to Elishnish for protection against the machinations of the Imperial establishment, she ends up deciding that the Empire is truly not a place where she can be. Instead of being slowly ground down by the unfeeling machinery of the cold, authoritarian state, she looks forward to making her mark on the world in a place where she can make a real difference. Fendros, Elise, and Ida, three are tainted scions who attended the Grand Ball held for Ryan Zulgaon in the web novel. Their respective houses are headed by classic low nobles grasping for past glories with imprudent decisions, buying their way into the ball in hopes that their daughters will be able to attract Heinz's favor. Ida didn't even have a name, poor thing. In Valkyrie's shadow, their parents are up to similar antics, this time sending Fendros and Elise to try and worm their way into the good graces of Frost-19. Ida's parents by this point are too poor to manage even that, opting to sell her into slavery. Fortunately for the attainted trio, Fendros encounters Nemel and the future Seneschal of Dame Verilin snatches them up. Fendros' talent of being able to randomly pick up magical capability is also something from the web novel. How nice of Maruyama to leave that for me to use. Frian Gushment. Frian holds the all-powerful position of student council president of the Imperial Magic Academy and the Overlord web novel. Behind the friendly big sister mask that she presents to the student body hides a stern, authoritarian princess of the Imperial dynasty. She is hailed as the genius of the Imperial Magic Academy, but she states that it is Arch who should truly hold that title. In Valkyrie's Shadow, Frian is first mentioned at the end of Birthright as the author of Fundamental Principles of Magocratic Governance. Einz tried reading her treatise, but his empty head overheated. The daughter of House Gushmund was the ideal colleague for the noble quartet in the Empire, a fellow noblewoman who shares the same, authoritarian outlook as them. A powerful, young wizard by imperial standards, and a junior aide to the Imperial Court Council. She takes it upon herself to escort the representatives from the Sorceress Kingdom around our winter. Frian takes a while to get through to, but she eventually discloses her ambitions to the noble quartet and unexpectedly finds friends who share in her reality. House Gushment is one of the main strongholds for the cultural dynasty of the Baharuth Empire and Frian will be a key player in imperial developments in the future. Dimmer Ear Eriks. A student of the Imperial Magic Academy from the Overlord web novel. At the academy, she was a sort of school information broker, sifting valuable information from the rumors and gossip of her fellow students. Her eventual goal was a position in the Empire's Department of Foreign Affairs. In Valkyrie's Shadow, she carries the same, high-energy personality as she had in the web novel. If I were to describe it, she is an entertaining listener who is used to drawing information out of people and knowing what they want to hear. 
Her energy works well with people like Leanne Wagner, who is a shrewd individual who enjoys playing the same game. For some reason, the Baharuth Empire does not have a diplomatic mission in the Sorceress Kingdom despite being a client state. Dimaia is another natural freebie from Maruyama and she will arrive in the future. Sophia Noya, a character from the Overlord mobile game Mass for the Dead, where she is one of Fluda's most powerful disciples and a monster researcher who specializes in slimes. Her interest in utilizing the capabilities of slimes in the game for the benefit of civilization carries into Valkyrie's shadow. In the light novel, Fluda is stripped of his titles, which are redistributed to his disciples, turning them into nobles. Sophia uses her land to pioneer her slime finery which draws the immediate interest of the noble quartet. Rango but Raburbad. The son of a concubine and scion of the powerful house Raburbad, Rango Bart is first introduced as a sort of antagonist in the web novel, trying to zone out Jet from Nemel. In the Imperial Magic Academy, he uses his influence as a High Lord's son to enforce the order of the Imperial establishment on the student body. As we are in Jet's path at this point, what we get is Testania's angsty internal monologue and his hatred for nobles. Jet's only defense against Rango Bart is sicking Freyan Gushmand on him who only humors Jet because he is an acquaintance through Arch. Later on, after Jet ends up with Fluda Paradine and Nobril Gamma on his promotional examination team, Rango Bart ends up teamless. Ainz, disguised as a student, ends up joining Rango Bart's team since Jet's team turns up unexpectedly full. Rango Bart then serves as a side reaction character to Ainz's bumbling around. His father recognizes Ainz as the evil god that granted him temporary youth and predictably tells Rango Bart to attend to Ainz. Along the way, they purchase some slaves at the slave market to add to their team, who are promptly turned into death knights. The imperial knights escorting them on the promotional examination are scared shitless. In Valkyrie's shadow, Rango Bart, like Nemel, has graduated from the promotional examination, joining the imperial army as a mage officer. His father pulls all sorts of strings to get him into the Second Legion and then pulls some more in order to hook him up with a certain Baroness Zerodnik. Born a spare only valued for his promising magical capabilities, Rango Bart expects to live his life as a tool for House Raburbad. The Imperial Army has done a good job at instilling a sense of purpose into the man, however, so his days as a student dependent on his family's influence are long past him. His sense of obligation for his family's favor still weighs heavily on him, but he is very much a man looking for his own way in the world. While drawn to the unexpectedly attractive liaison officer from the Sorceress Kingdom, Rango Bart is even more impressed by her charisma and insight into his role as a mage officer. Through several adventures, Ludmilla plants a seed of ambition within him, to create a true place for mages in the Imperial Army, something that he believes he is in a unique position to accomplish. At the end of his time with Ludmilla, he encounters Nemel Gran and finally voices why he acted the way that he did in the Academy. Rango Bart has parted ways with the main cast for now, but, as implied by his invitation, he will be back at some point. Rerix Xtrius. A cold and calculating ancient green dragon who might be considered the personification of the Baharuth Empire, Rerix Xtrius was one of the oldest of the post-tier magic dragons in the New World. Hatching into a lonely world where dragonkind was decimated by the eight greed kings and irrevocably altered to no longer wield wild magic, the green dragon matron eventually settled down to produce offspring in the steaming jungle caldera of the blister. She isn't satisfied with just hatching wimmerlings, however, she wants to produce green dragons who are well versed in green dragon ways and capable of surviving in a much harsher world. A cushy agreement with the imperial cities nearby makes her domain potentially the most well-protected locale in the human sphere, at least from catastrophic threats that merit Rerix Xtrius intervention. Unfortunately for her, the Sorceress Kingdom calls for her removal. Using her substantial knowledge, she technically discerns what sort of threat she is facing. Not many people come to the irrational conclusion of being attacked by aliens, however, and the highly rational Rerix Xtrius is no exception. She now rests amidst more treasure than she could ever dream of. Tyra. In Overlord Volume 14, Idania randomly appears as a mention, they are under the authority of Demiurge, who sets up an intelligence division on the seventh floor of Nazarick. Since we were exploring the Empire, I decided to pick them up. Tyra is not a cruel, heartless individual, but maintains an air of strict professionalism when she's on the job. 
She loves hot baths and cares deeply for the ninja clan that she has been entrusted to her by previous generations. Meticulous and calculating, she doesn't solely rely on her power as a hero realm individual, instead doing everything she believes necessary to eliminate her targets. Like so many other competent and powerful by New World standards, characters in Overlord, her careful preparations fall apart when what she believes to be a human was far more than she could ever expect. Now, Tara and her ninja clan work for the Sorceress Kingdom. I suppose this is a good thing for the overall welfare of her clan, but I'm not sure about working conditions on Nazarick's seventh floor. Joachim Ward. The only Imperial Losipov in Empire in Chains. Joachim is a spare and the grandson of Baron Ward. Like Ludmilla once upon a time, he took up training as an acolyte, but, unlike Ludmilla, he can cast magic. He is the first puff of a cleric of the four elemental gods, but as an imperial soldier, he can't push his faith on anyone else. This results in a rather reactive point of view for a religious character and Ludmilla similarly is quiet and internally reactive about her opinions of his faith. Joachim accidentally ends up in General Ray's battalion as a cleric attached to a company hand-picked for both its ambitious members and its lack of nobles. General Ray finds a use for him by attaching the cleric to Ludmilla Zarudnik as she travels around the Wyvern Mark. As a member of the Old Guard of the Imperial Army, Joachim is accustomed to the Baroness behavior and also shares his grandfather's opinion of General Ray. As the scion of a martial house, he prefers to remain reserved observing the behavior of others and slowly building his opinion of them. Fortunately for Ray's battalion, Ludmilla is as powerful as Joachim suspects her to be and his time assigned to her allows him to gather valuable insights that an imperial noble would otherwise not be exposed to. He remains in the Sixth Legion, thankful that the seemingly unbridled ambition of the expeditionary force has been tempered by their experience. General Ray. General Ray is the Overlord web novel's version of Nyabaraha. More accurately, Nyabaraha is Ray V2.0, adjusted to be more cute, powerless and stupid. Both characters are written as a jab at certain overlord readers, the ones who seem to applaud Ayn's and Nazarick's actions no matter how reprehensible and will justify even the most atrocious acts with crazy mental gymnastics. In the WM, Ray is the aggressive and ambitious general of the Eighth Legion who advocates for the mopping up of the shattered remains of Reistise's royal army after Splatfist much to the horror and disgust of his fellow generals. The guy has a little lion's boner, as in an erection, when he thinks of the Battle of Katza Plains and the absolute power displayed by Ayn's Ulgaon. After Ayn's joins the Empire as the Super Marquis of E. Rantel, General Ray maneuvers to attach himself to Ayn's. Jerk Niv, of course, is furious with his power play, but he cannot touch Ray because of his association with Ayn's. In Valkyrie's shadow, Ray still loves, and is aroused by, power, but he is unexpectedly stripped of power when the Eighth Legion is dissolved. It is a frustrating experience and he ends up under his former CO, General Gregan. Accustomed to dealing with obstacles and setbacks, he wastes no time devising a plan to get into the Sorceress Kingdom's good graces. Additionally, he leaps on the chance to send Nemel Grand to accompany Frost-19 and Joachim Ward is later sent to attend to Ludmilla Zaradnik. When he finally encounters the Baroness, he already has all sorts of preconceptions of her based on the information that he has gathered and analyzed, which is in turn influenced by imperial biases towards Rhea's ties. Ludmilla is on an entirely different wavelength from the general, however, so a strange back and forth occurs until Ray realizes what he is dealing with and adjusts his perceptions and interactions accordingly. As an aristocrat, General Ray is something like the opposite of Ludmilla's Aradnik. Raised in the hostile and intrigue-ridden political landscape of the Baharuth Empire, he forsakes his values as a martial noble to pursue his ambitions. He is an aggressive and dynamic counterpoint to Ludmilla's defensive and methodical mindset, someone Ludmilla might have become had she never been rescued from Ray's situation by Pandora's actor and Shaltier Bloodfallen and offered a place where service is valued above all. In the end, they develop a candid rapport with Ludmilla learning many valuable lessons about herself and the aggressive nature of martial nobles long forgotten after generations of desperate defense. General Ray, in return, receives a crash course in the realities of the world beyond the human lands protected by the slain theocracy. Both Ludmilla and Ray come out of their respective experiences as more well-rounded people, with Ray now working to create an imperial expeditionary force that is better prepared for its mandate. Ray is the second human puff in Valkyrie's shadow, the first being Ludmilla Zarodnik, 
who subscribes to a warrior culture that most readers are entirely unfamiliar with. These warrior cultures were common several centuries ago, but exhibit behaviors that are generally reviled by most societies today. Most would likely equate those behaviors to violent criminal gangs or militant groups known for their atrocities. Many things are simply perceived differently in such cultures and certain values are drastically different. Violence and aggression in pursuit of those values are promoted and how loss and grief are processed seems strange or even crazy. Many show certain forms of elitism, such as seeing cavalry or duels of champions as superior in warfare and their attitudes are shared across social strata. A battle slave in this sort of society might yawn for freedom, but their idea of freedom is becoming a warlord that owns thousands of battle slaves and conquering their way to riches and glory. These types of cultures may produce anything from brutish thugs to sophisticated warrior poets. The imperial army's culture is a sort of defanged version due to their defensive mandate and right to wage wars of aggression taken from them. However, many of the dormant attitudes of the imperial army's martial culture come to light when the Sixth Legion becomes an expeditionary force. Though he is a fictional character, Conan the Barbarian sort of sums up what may be considered best in life for these people, to crush your enemies, to see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentations of their women. The civilian nobles in the sorceress kingdom are often portrayed as fearful of Ludmilla and this is the underlying reason why. She is born and raised as a killing machine in a warrior culture, plus she worships a god of death. Like many of the notable characters in Empire and Chains, General Ray will be back. Jet Testania. I killed him. Ziggy demanded it. The Forbidden One of the Overlord web novel, Archer Nemel's eye-patched childhood friend is often blamed for assassinating the web novel. In classic Overlord form, he is one of the New World sidekick povs that every story arc has. We never see where his character journey ends up, but it doesn't seem to go anywhere at all from what exists of it. Rango Butt's summary of Jet's character in Act 5 is pretty much it, a hypocritical teenager with a victim mentality, one who hates the nobility and all that they stand for, yet relies on them and aspires to join the peerage at the same time. As a practicing mage born with a practically useful talent, he is one of the privileged few, yet he acts as if he is one of the downtrodden and characterizes himself as a generally righteous individual when he is in reality rather unscrupulous and exploitative. Jet never makes a direct appearance in Valkyrie's shadow, instead being referred to in various povs. He first appears in Nemel's thoughts and readers are eventually made aware of his presence in the Sixth Legion as a member of Ray's battalion. During Ray's battle against the demi-human forces in the southern wilderness, Jet meets his end as one of the many unnamed soldiers who fell that night. In the end, the only one who cares for the death of Jet and his mother is his childhood friend, Nemel, who had supported him through his days at the academy after House Furt was attainted. Too bad he was such a douche to her. Ilishn apostrophe ish equals Verilin. As usual, people either love or hate Ilishnish. Those that love her, love her for her draconic perspective. Those that hate her, hate her for her draconic perspective. And then there are those people that still expect her to be a human and hate her for doing things nonsensical to humans, but I'm not sure what to do about that. Finally out on the task originally assigned to her back in Winter's Crown, Ilishnish enjoys a vast degree of freedom in the Empire. It is enhanced by her new status as Ludmilla's vassal and companion, which bestows a variety of bonuses that reinforce her physical and, more importantly, mental resilience. The machinations of Pandora's actor and Aura through the collaboration of Shultir finally bear their first fruits as she wanders about in her somewhat chaotic frost dragon way. As the big fish in the pond, she struts around quite a bit, experiencing the world to her heart's content and living the life of exploration that she dreamed of. Adventuring is also a big surprise to her, as she has always feared adventurers and ends up earning a tidy sum as one. Her time fighting together with Ludmilla in the blister also turns out to be extraordinarily lucrative. The Empire is Ilishnish's first true experience with a fully human society and she doesn't care much for what she sees. She is quite open about how she feels with those that she grows familiar with, speaking authoritatively from her frost dragon perspective. This is jarring to many humans but Zushiru and his apprentices roll with it, accustomed to the same reality from generations of living with the frost dragons of the Azalizia Mountains. Ilishnish's draconic instincts, intuitive behavior and bardic powers make for a powerful combination as she interacts with people on her journeys. Simply put, she is irresistible to most and only those knowledgeable about the charismatic powers of a bard are aware of it. 
We also see the first use of her personally composed spell songs, which Nemel notes are unique in their effect, to say the least. In true bard fashion, she turns those initially sent to exploit her to her advantage. Ilishnish ends up with her first vassal in the form of Nemel Gran who she gauges to be a good and reliable minion. With her new minion and her minion's minions, in tow, the Frost Dragon Knight returns to the Sorceress Kingdom anticipating great things for the future of her territory, mostly in the form of taxes. Ludmilla Zaradnik. Starting as a sort of tourist with her friends on a trip to our winter, Ludmilla finds herself lost in the complexities and nuances of the Imperial capital. Nothing makes sense and a lot of things are outright offensive but thankfully she has her friends around to hold her hand. The imperial institutions that she and her friends look forward to seeing as a potential model for the Sorceress Kingdom to use reveal both the good and bad aspects of imperial society. In all, they suffer a sort of Paris syndrome when it comes to our winter, but there are still many notable takeaways. Ludmilla's duties acting as a liaison officer to the imperial army take up most of her time in the empire where she is pleasantly surprised by the Second Legion. Immersed in a familiar culture established by martial nobles who possess similar ideals, values and behavior, their open-armed welcome is an uplifting experience for the lonely frontier noble who once believed that she was the last of her kind. In the blister, she succeeds wildly at making a good impression on the Imperial Army, ensuring that the Viridian Dragon Lord is dealt with and the Death Seer's servitors are well on their way to being adopted by the Second Legion. What appears to be the exact opposite of the Second Legion, however, awaits her in the Wyvernmark. After being exposed to the rather scathing commentary of the Fifth Legion in regards to the Sixth Legion and their activities in the Southern Wilderness, Ludmilla makes a beeline for General Ray and his battalion of raiders. She spends a lot of time weighing and measuring the qualities of the Imperial General and his men, trying to figure out what it means to be a member of the Expeditionary Force. With the Baharuth Empire's general safety assured by the existence of the Sorceress Kingdom, a spirit of aggressive expansionism has awakened, its growth stimulated by albedo. Perceptions of the wilderness have changed from dangerous uncharted territory to unclaimed lands ripe for the taking. Driving this is a human-centric society that spares little thought for anyone but themselves. Rather than oppose them directly, Ludmilla understands that it is their blindness to the truths of the world and not their ambitions that are inherently problematic. In her attempts to point out the fallacies in their thinking and misconceptions that they have about the world at large, she is forced to confront aspects of herself that have been central in the failures that she has been leaving in her wake. Her time with General Ray and his battalion not only serves as a catalyst for the Empire to rethink its policies and approaches to expansion but also for Ludmilla to examine the generally reactive and passive posture that dominates many aspects of her life. Ludmilla returns to the Sorceress Kingdom with a myriad of new ideas, though finding true balance as a commander and as a person is still a long journey. She has a lot of things to both catch up with and get going, both in Warden's Vale and with the Royal Army. Albedo Albedo doesn't get many opportunities in Overlord Canon to shine in her role as Prime Minister of the Sorceress Kingdom and as a Supreme Administrator. For the most part, she's used as a checklist when it comes to reviewing what goes on from volume to volume before going on to act as either an inciter or some sort of comic relief. The Guardian Overseer gets to show her stuff more frequently and in more detail in Valkyrie's Shadow, though one can say that this should naturally be the case as the story is a kingdom builder. Most of the time, Albedo's influence can only be perceived in subtext or indirectly through the progress of the Sorceress Kingdom or through the words and actions of the NPCs that she influences. In Empire in Chains, however, Albedo takes center stage as the mastermind behind the events in the Empire. As the three geniuses of Nazarick tend to achieve many objectives with their actions in Valkyrie's shadow, Albedo goes all out with the Empire. Starting with a few changes to Imperial law and the reorganization of the Imperial Army, she goes on to remove a few old problems and transforms the Baharuth Empire into a nation-sized laboratory investigating the behavior of human society and its potential in various uses. More than a few people recognize at least in part what she is up to, including Emperor Jerk Niv, General Carbane, and General Ray. Ludmilla also understands what is going on, though she has the benefit of the Sorceress Kingdom's perspectives, and once again does what she can to collaborate with the Prime Minister to produce some useful results. The right tool for the right job the success of the characters in Valkyrie's Shadow has brought up some interesting commentary, commentary that indicates that a major point about the story has been missed despite being blatantly put out there on a regular basis. 
This is the fact that pretty much every case of success has been an instance of purposeful deployment. Furthermore, we have a cast with many characters who are competent in their respective ways and generally maintain relationships that are collaborative in nature. As such, the plot-based conflicts are usually not in people butting heads and struggling against one another to achieve their objectives, but in figuring out how to get things done in their respective styles. The result of this conflict is how these styles mix and produce various outcomes in the story. This starts from the very beginning of Valkyrie's Shadow and only becomes more and more prevalent as the story goes on and the characters grow and establish themselves. People succeed because they are set up to succeed or are at least a suitable choice for any particular task. Whenever they enter unfamiliar territory, they start to flounder around and get tripped up. As they are not incompetent, however, they know when to shut up, watch and learn. They are also perfectly willing to turn to others for help. Out of Nazarick's NPCs, Albedo, Demiurge and Pandora's actor exercise the most influence on the Sorcerer's Kingdom in this story. This is not only because they choose the actors that succeed when and where they want them to, but those actors also fail when and where they want them to. This often happens simultaneously to nudge a myriad of far-reaching plans forward. The actors in question often do not realize what they are failing at and what their failures cost. The three geniuses of Nazarick are not the only ones that do this, but they are the ones that are most likely to succeed in their deployments. They are master groomers, making the actors on the stage grow where they want them to grow, stay deficient where they want them to remain deficient and achieve the objectives that they send them out to achieve. Just as it would be strange for us to expect a carpenter to use a saw to hammer a nail, so too do I find it strange that people expect Albedo, Demiurge and Pandora's actor to fail at using tools with qualities that they are well aware of. If Albedo assigns Ludmilla a task that she is absolutely not suited for, Ludmilla's failure at that task is the same as the carpenter Albedo trying to hammer a nail with a saw. As Albedo is not an incompetent idiot, this will not happen when she is closely involved. Failures may occur when there are more than one or two degrees of separation between Albedo and the tool in question, but in the Sorcerer's Kingdom, this is seldom the case. The right tool is used for the right job, if the tool is unsuited, there are other tools to use. Albedo, who oversees both Nazarick and the Sorcerer's Kingdom, will never use a saw to hammer a nail when she has a hammer on hand, unless she believes that Ainz is telling her to. Similarly, how characters operate under the masterful control of Nazarick's NPCs to achieve both the objectives of their masters as well as their own is one of the overarching threads of Valkyrie's shadow, a fine line for many to walk, especially when there are conflicts of interest. Schedule and formatting changes. As some may be aware, volumes of Valkyrie's Shadow are written as complete novels first and then divided into chapters for daily release. The original plan was that each chapter would be 2,000 to 2,500 words, but this isn't working out very well. With the type of story that it is, there is a lot of exploration of the setting that can make it seem like the story is moving slowly, especially when there is a lot of setup in one chapter and most of the action in the next, making it seem like there are pacing issues. In reality, it's one much larger scene but broken up into chapters of the planned length. Trying to fix up the breaks so that they go smoothly from one segment to the next also generates additional word count, sometimes up to double the original chapter length. This is especially true for combat and segments with a lot of exposition. Many people have noted that to overcome the idea that this stalls the action, one should just wait and binge chapters. Most just read chapters as they come out so, in the end, I've decided to split up the volumes into longer chapters. This should make it easier to have meatier chapters with better pacing or at least more stuff in them. The downside to this is that chapters will come out every other day rather than every day. Valkyrie's Shadow will still go along at the same rate as before, but with a format change that will hopefully address the issues that short chapters have been causing. Well, we'll see if it works out. Next up. In traditional Overlord style, the next volume begins in the Sorceress Kingdom where many things are brewing. We're rewinding the clock a bit, starting a month before the end of this volume. After that, Valkyrie's shadow will go from the rigid order of Empire and Chains to lands that are just a bit more chaotic in the Tiger and the Dragon. Once again, thank you for reading Valkyrie's Shadow. If you've somehow gotten through this many words and haven't left a rating or review on Royal Road, please consider lending your support long web novels on the site or something of a revolving door where people drop rating bombs right at the front. 
As a fanfiction on a site that is inherently hostile to fanfictions, this appears to be quadruply so. 15th day, lower water month, 0c. Glaza, come play. What are you playing? We're. A gaggle of immature human males ran up to Glaza as classes came to an end. The students made their way out of the schoolhouse, filling the air with their excited chatter. The one who had called out to her was named Raoul, one of the Lord class students who controlled a tribe that made up roughly half of the class. Human Lord types were different from Lord class demi humans, however, he wasn't the biggest kid in the class, just one of the noisiest. The students who commanded the most attention attracted the most followers and became the lords. The warden was also a lord who presided over the entire territory and attracted plenty of attention when she wanted to, but she was the opposite of noisy. Maybe the abilities that the warden had were something that they got as they grew up. Glaza looked around at the expectant expressions of the human children. She didn't know why they called out for her to join them every day but the human adults seemed to think nothing of it. In fact, they seemed to encourage them to do so. Glaza had a few hours before her druid lessons with the lizardmen, so it wasn't as if she had anything better to do. Glaza, come with us, the boys just want to stare at your boobs. A bunch of the boys became flustered as the second of the Lord class students showed up. This one was an immature human female named Olga and her tribe consisted of most of the females in the class. The girl tribe leveled looks in a group attack that set the boy tribe back two steps. THTH that's not true. Raoul protested. Then why are you all turning red? Olga leaned forward as she peered at him, I know that you keep trying to peek through her leaves. That's, that's your fault. Glaza didn't get it. She wasn't even human, so why did they show signs of human interest toward her? Raoul had clearly been defeated, however, so she went over to join the winner. What are we doing? Let's go to your mother's place and get some elder liches, Olga said. Hey. Raoul whined, but death knights are better. Ah, so they're coming too. What was the point of the battle just now? They were all going to do the same thing anyway. Death knights are too fast. We won't be able to see anything. Elder liches are better. The boys always wanted death knights. They were big and awesome and powerful and, after watching them train once, all that Raoul and the rest of the boys wanted was to watch them beat each other up. Dryads didn't have the same violent instincts that humans did, so Glaza couldn't empathize with them when it came to that kind of stuff. They made their way across the village square, where Glaza entered the warden's manor. She sat aside her school bag before going up to the war room on the second floor. Several elder liches looked up from the table in the center, while a half-elf with teal hair looked up from the couch where she was nursing her offspring. Welcome home, Glaza, Willuvian Linum smiled. How was school? Fine. Um, the other kids want some elder liches. Playing war again? Glaza nodded. The half-elf maid looked towards the elder liches at the table. I'll send some to meet you at the usual place. Thanks. Glaza went back outside, holding up her woody thumb to the kids waiting out on the street. They all grinned in response and scattered towards their respective homes. Everyone met again at one of the makeshift battlefields that had appeared over the winter. Since there was no development slated in the northern part of the island for the near future, Lord Mayor had turned the area into a temporary exercise area for the Royal Army stationed at the base on the southern end of the island. Playing war was so popular that they went there every day after classes, picking a different field to battle on each day. While they were gathering, two dozen elder liches arrived from the south, riding a pair of wagons drawn by soul eaters. They divided themselves into two groups on opposite ends of the chosen field. The two student tribes split up, hiding behind their respective hills as they prepared their forces. The rules of the game were complicated but the humans seemed to have no problems understanding them. Each side had twelve elder liches, who would use second tier summoning spells to provide soldiers for each army. This meant that each elder lich could summon four first tier summons or a single second tier summon. One might think to always summon the strongest beings possible, but there were additional conditions. Foremost amongst them was that each team had a set war budget that they used to equip their armies. Most of the students in the class were children from artisan families and the budget that they received came from the education budget meant to pay for vocational training in the domain. The weapons, armor and other equipment that had been carted over by the children were all made by them. Their parents helped where it was required, but they were instructed to only provide guidance and let their apprentices do the work. 
Glaza pulled out a weapon from one of the carts, frowning at it dubiously. What's this? she asked. A morning star, the girl across the cart answered. Why is it shaped like a heart? Because they're cute. Then why does the heart have spikes? Because it's a morning star. Glaza shook her head as she placed the weapon into the hand of a zombie before helping put some chain mail over the gambesine of the next. The slow, clumsy undead had become the mainstay of their army over the past month. They were resistant to bludgeoning attacks but weak to slashing. Chain mail armor, however, was good against slashing attacks and the gambesons were difficult to puncture. Zombies were already tough without equipment and its addition made them super tough. The other summons who could be equipped were subject to similar attempts to make them better. Different types of arrows were added to the quivers of the skeleton archers. Even the skeleton mages were adorned in protective robes and helmets. We're short a robe, one of the girls said. Huh? Olga furrowed her brow. How can we be short a whole robe? I I don't know. I'm pretty sure I put it in with the other one this morning. There were problems like that, too. It was a good thing that their soldiers didn't need to eat. After thirty minutes of fuss, their soldiers were marched over to the battlefield on the other side of the hill. Their two medium fire elementals were the only summons without equipment. The rest of their army consisted of sixteen zombies, eight skeleton archers, two skeleton mages, and eight skeleton riders. Their group spread out tarps over the slope, settling down to watch the battle. Light snow started to fall from the overcast skies, but the students were bundled in layered garments and paid it no mind. They gathered in groups of threes and fours, enjoying the snacks and beverages that had been prepared for them. Sighs of admiration rose from the girls as Olga appeared on the command tower on top of the hill, striking a gallant pose. Olga's gotten taller again, she kinda looks kind of like your mother, doesn't she? Glaza's mother was the warden, Ludmilla Zaradnik. For some reason, the humans all preferred to refer to her that way when Glaza was around. She supposed that they weren't entirely wrong about their relationship, it was because of the Warden and Lord Mayor that she was born. Still, the association meant more than just that to the humans, it represented everything that went into the relationship between mother and child, which Glaza did not particularly care either way about. I think she's doing that on purpose, Glaza said. I don't think she can grow on purpose. I mean she's wearing her hair the same. And her plumage. Plumage? Um, dress. In short, Olga idolized Baroness Sarodnik, imitating her appearance as best as she could. She had the same, long chestnut hair tied up into a ponytail and she wore a forest green coat over her dress. Olga was a very lively and expressive human, so she worked very hard at looking serious and frowning as much as possible. Being born to a family of carpenters was no obstacle. She was inspired to command armies just like the woman she looked up to. This inspiration also came with hard work and what the Linum sisters recognized as genuine talent, so no one questioned whether she would be able to succeed or not. Gay, they're doing it again. What's with all of those accessories? Sour looks and commentary from the Olga tribe rose as the opposing army took to the field. The summons on the other side were armed and armored as well, but their equipment had notable differences. Personally, Glaza thought that they looked better. For things that were supposed to fight, at least. Their armor was bulkier and had spikes and such, making them a far more intimidating sight. Raoul's front line consisted of eight undead beasts in the form of goats. They had clearly received the majority of the army budget and were draped from shoulder to flank in something like coat of plates. Helms adorned their heads and iron reinforcements were fitted to their horns. Behind them were eight skeleton archers and two skeleton mages. Even the skeleton mages had robes that were designed to make them look more imposing. As the lines formed, the elder liches lined up under the command towers on either side so they could hear Olga and Raoul's instructions. Olga raised a green flag. Raoul raised a green flag on the other side and the battle began. Charge. Raoul's voice echoed from across the field and his forces started running forward. For some reason, someone blew a horn on the other side. Charge again? A girl nearby said, is that all they can do? Not that they needed to do anything else. The undead beasts were big and heavy and their equipment made them even heavier. Undead were tireless, so even if they couldn't maneuver as quickly with all the stuff on them, they had plenty of distance to build up speed. Since low-tier summons didn't have much in the way of skills or abilities that could deal with strong attacks, charging with undead beasts was a simple and effective tactic. From her platform, 
Olga frowned out at the enemy advancing over the field. Cavalry go around. Throw javelins at those goats when you go by, but keep going. The clatter of hooves on stone sounded in the air as the skeleton riders on their skeletal horses moved accordingly, charging out from the wings to either side. Zombies, stay in your ranks. Stop those goats. Fire elementals, stay behind. Archers attack when the enemy gets in range. What about the skeleton mages? An elder lich asked. Ah, uh, hold for now. The students from both sides leaned forward as the battle took shape. The two cavalry wings did as instructed, hurling javelins into the undead beasts as they passed one another. The long iron projectiles stuck fast but didn't destroy any of their targets. You were, double kill? The girl beside her said. Glaza nodded. It seemed like it. The skeleton riders and the undead beasts did not divert to fight one another, instead heading straight towards each other's infantry lines. Arrows from the skeleton archers landed amidst the undead beasts, but their armor prevented much of the damage. Splatum. Raoul raised his fists into the air. The undead beasts lowered their heads, smashing into the zombie ranks. Weapons flew into the air as many were knocked over. A few were pushed back and low zombie moans filled the air. The well-equipped zombies managed to absorb the assault and the enemy's charge was quickly bogged down as the undead heavy infantry latched onto them, biting and clawing at their targets. The undead beasts struggled and stomped, lashing their horns and hooves in an attempt to dislodge and destroy their opponents. Olga leaned over the railing of her platform, a finger stabbing out at the battle as she shouted her orders. Fire elementals, start getting rid of those undead beasts. Skeleton mages, focus on the same targets. Cavalry, run down the enemy mages and archers. Far afield, the skeleton riders made contact with the enemy army's rear line. Two had been destroyed on the way and by skeleton mages, but the cavalry that got through wreaked havoc. The skeleton riders had been equipped with armor that mostly negated enemy arrows. Like the undead beasts, their skeletal horses had been equipped with thick caparisons and crude sections of plate armor that not only deflected physical attacks but added weight to their tireless charge. Most of the damage that the skeleton riders inflicted was not with their weapons, but through smashing into their targets and trampling them. Cheers rose from the girls as the cavalry charge flattened the enemy's skeletons, scattering fragments of bone about. Good job, Olga shouted over the field, come back and help out here. While Olga had successfully dispatched the enemy's ranged forces, her front line wasn't doing so well. All but four of her zombies were destroyed while six undead beasts remained. The zombies had held up well but they were mostly unable to damage the undead beasts and were slowly destroyed instead. Two of the undead beasts were now rampaging around the rear lines while two faced off against each of the fire elementals. Above, in the command tower, Olga silently bit her lip and stared as if silently willing her cavalry to move faster. In the end, Olga barely eked out a victory, losing all but two of her skeleton cavalry. One of the royal army's elder liches, who had been observing from above, floated down to her platform. Out of a total of 48 points, it said in a dry and raspy voice, two points remain. While technically a victory, losing over 95% of one's forces is unacceptable by our army's standards for conventional field battles. Glaza didn't get why the result was a problem. Both teams used 48 points worth of summons and the same equipment budget. After all, how could the Royal Army expect more when both sides were equal? Olga, however, only nodded and crossed her arms, frowning down at the aftermath of the battle. I'll try and figure something out, she said. Let's clean everything up and get ready for the next round. The students rose from their seats on the hillside, making their way over to collect the equipment. Since destroyed and dismissed summons simply dematerialized, all of their equipment just fell to the ground. Elder liches came over from both sides, taking notes as the students inspected the battle's effects on their work. Though it was something that the children played, the game was also a part of their training. The warden had come up with the rules and arranged for everything while she was working somewhere in the Baharuth Empire. She had been inspired to create the game by the Sorcerer King during a trip to the Katza Plains, some sort of undead place in the east over the mountains. Every participant got vocational experience out of it. The children apprenticing as smiths, tailors, carpenters and other similar jobs produced equipment for the armies, striving to come up with new and better things. The children of merchants handled inventory and logistics. 
There were a few cooks who provided catering to the rest of the participants while the student lords were training to become commanders. In the city, no kids were apprenticing in rural vocations, so almost every human child in the harbor participated in the game. The only ones that didn't were apprentice mages. They still came and watched, however, and would eventually participate when the battles weren't mostly mundane. As they collected the equipment and brought it back behind the hill, the students reported their findings to their chief. Olga, it's like Miss Willuvian said, right? The zombies can fight for longer when we equip them but they can barely do any damage. Everything is too heavily armored now. They stink with weapons, too. Un. Olga, the skeleton archers are too weak. Even when we make good arrows for them, they can't get through all the armor. Un. Even if they said so, the feedback was not so easily adopted. The composition of each team's forces and the equipment used were not decided on in a day. What saw battle at present was the product of weeks of planning and work. When the game first started, both teams were the same. They had an equal number of zombies, skeletons, skeleton archers, and skeleton riders. No one had any idea what they were doing at first, they were just told to have fun fighting with their soldiers and seeing what they could do to improve things. After a week, the first pieces of crude equipment started to appear. Compositions and formations started to change and everyone got into the spirit of things, contributing their skills to the war effort. Even the adults marveled as their apprentices laid the groundwork for a makeshift war industry, creating a miniature economy that revolved around their game. As the battles continued to evolve and become more complex, so too did the industries that supported them. According to the Lynham sisters, the warden had purposely intended for this to happen. The game was a foundational piece of one of the institutions that she was raising in Warden's Vale, the Military Academy's Institute of War. It was also intended to be a pastime for the subjects of Warden's Vale, combining training, entertainment and innovation. Three battles were held each day and each day was part of a greater season. Seasonal assessments would be made and the teams eventually sorted out into leagues. They were all currently in the Copper League, which used 48-point armies limited to second-tier summoning spells. The Iron League had 96-point armies but the same tier restrictions. Silver League matches used 192-point armies with third-tier restrictions, while Gold League matches were restricted to third-tier but had 384-point armies. Team equipment budgets, of course, also increased relative to each league. The budgets were a lump sum meant to last the entire season, so teams had to be mindful of their expenditures and endeavored to make the most efficient use of their resources. There was no set age for each league. Instead, promotions were based on the proven skills of individual team members. Lady Zaradnik's tentative expectations, however, were that silver would start somewhere around the age of 14 while gold would be around the age of adulthood for humans, which was 20. Higher leagues would exist as well, but they were considered the big leagues dash a realm where masters at their craft plied their skills, fielding far larger armies. The battles held in those leagues, however, would be a weekly affair rather than a daily one and held on much more expansive and varied battlefields. Let's trade the skeleton archers for skeleton mages, Olga told the elder liches. What about the zombies? Someone asked. They still stopped the charge, Olga answered. They just couldn't kill those stupid undead beasts fast enough. Since the skeleton archers didn't do anything last time, it should be better now. Why not more fire elementals? Because it's too crowded at the start of the fight. They'll be hitting our stuff as well as theirs. The skeleton mages can hurt them from range. Olga put a lot of time and effort into studying for the game outside of school. After fighting battles every day all winter, she was building up a lot of knowledge and experience. They prepared their forces once again, bringing them out to the front of the hill for another battle. On the other side of the field, the other army appeared to be unchanged. Olga climbed up into her command tower again. Her frown kept slipping up into a smile upon seeing the advantage brought about by her changes. She raised her green flag. Raoul signaled his readiness to begin as well. Charge. He repeated his command from the previous battle. In response, Olga repeated her orders as well. Her cavalry swept out around the advancing undead beasts, hurling javelins into them as they passed. Splatum. Huh? The confused voice of Olga rose into a strangled squawk. In response to Raoul's call, the undead beasts wheeled around and went after Olga's skeleton riders. 
The female student lord pointed a finger out at her cavalry, shouting in panic. Everyone get up there and help. Olga's zombies shuffled forward. Her fire elementals and ranged support overtook them in her desperate bid to have the rest of her forces join the fight. While they did so, Raoul's skeleton archers and skeleton mages scattered and the mass charge of Olga's cavalry caught less than a handful. With the skeleton riders' charge spent, the undead beasts caught up from behind and destroyed them with help from the surviving ranged troops. Raoul issued another command to charge and his undead beasts turned around to attack the attempted relief from Olga's main force. As the undead beasts crashed into the fire elementals, stone arrows rained down and broke apart all but one of her undead mages. It wasn't long until all that was left of Olga's army was the line of zombies still shuffling their way to the battle. Wah ha 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 Raoul's voice rolled from the far side of the field, on your knees. Olga clicked her tongue. Lady Zarudnik would never say anything like that, she muttered. Despite her griping, the female student lord raised a white flag. The battle had become hopeless. Wild cheering rose from the boy's side. The elder lich observers came down with their results. Out of 48 points, one said, 16 remain. While this result is numerically superior to the previous battle, defeat is hardly an acceptable method to achieve it. That sounded mean. Olga saved some of her troops and their equipment. That should count for something, shouldn't it? What about the other team? Olga asked. The other team ended the battle with 32 points remaining. While not ideal, it is tolerable by royal army standards. Glass aside, why did it turn out like that? Was it because Raoul did a weird trick? Maybe warfare was about tricking people. After the artisan students analyzed their results and recovered the team's equipment, they gathered behind Olga behind the hill again. W we can still win. One of the girls said, it's just a tight now. Are we going to change the zombies out? Another girl asked. Or maybe we can just keep the army together? We'll change the zombies out, Olga said. But Raoul might change something now, too. MMH. The student lord stared at the ground for a long while before looking up again. How about we try something new? New? Someone said, but we haven't had time to prepare. Our equipment only fits zombies and skeletons, Olga said. There aren't any we can stick our stuff on that'll work well against those undead beasts. How about imps? Glaza said, they can use the smaller weapons. Plus they can fly. They're tough, Olga replied, but their attacks are weak. They have poison but everything on the boys' team is immune. They'll get tired, too. Maybe at Silver League things will change, but undead and elementals are too good at copper. Since she studied druidic magic, Glaza knew a bit about summons. Olga was right, since most low-tier summons were weak, it was better to pick them for their racial traits. Undead had many advantages over living summons and they could use all sorts of equipment. The alternative was to use elementals, which were tough, tireless and had special traits of their own. You want to summon different elementals, then? Glazer asked. Yeah, Olga answered with a nod. Four more medium fire elementals since their undead are weak against fire damage. Also, four medium air elementals to replace the zombies. They have a special attack that I want to try out. What are you replacing with the fire elementals? The skeleton mages, Olga replied. I still think the skeleton riders will be useful. They just died in a dumb way last time. Olga studied for the battles a lot so there wasn't much anyone could say about her changes. They summoned their third army, which was much faster to equip. Can these air elementals use anything? One of the smith girls asked. Um, they should be able to hold a light weapon? The smith girl grabbed a dagger from a cart. She walked up to the nearly transparent, swirling bundle of wind and stopped. Ah, uh, how does it hold it? She frowned. I I don't know, Olga said, just try giving it to the thing. Flipping the dagger in her hand, the smith girl held it out to the medium air elemental. After a moment, she let it go. The weapon remained suspended in front of her. That's kinda weird. Back up a bit, Olga told everyone, I want to see how it attacks. Once everyone was safely away, Olga issued a command. The dagger started making a circuit in midair. It whirled faster and faster around the medium air elemental until a whistling noise followed the weapon through the air. It looks scary, someone said, but isn't that a slashing attack? That's not going to get through their armor. 
They can stab too, Olga said. Probably. We need to set up a way to test this stuff someday. The whistling blade stopped. It started moving back and forth in the air as if it was poking something. Since it just looked like a dagger moving back and forth, they couldn't tell how good it was. Once they equipped the rest of the medium air elementals with light weapons, they returned to the battlefield to organize their ranks and see what Raoul's team had been up to. Not surprisingly, he kept the undead beasts that had done so well in the previous battle. He also kept the skeleton mages, but, like Olga, the other team realized that the skeleton archers hadn't been very useful. In their place were two medium water elementals. Those elementals are bad, aren't they? A girl in Glass's group said, they're going to hurt ours lots. The boys across the field appeared to be discussing the changes to Olga's team in return. Raoul cupped his hands around his mouth. Hey, aren't you missing some? He he. Olga replied, I guess you'll have to wait and see. They couldn't see the air elementals from where they were. Glaza supposed it made sense, they were air, after all. Olga signaled her readiness. Raoul did the same. The enemy army advanced. No charge this time? Glaza frowned. Maybe he's scared because he can't figure out what Olga is using. Raoul's forces came within 50 meters before Olga started issuing her orders. Air elementals, fly up to 10 meters. Cavalry, advance outwards. Charge. Raoul called out. The entire enemy force surged forward, straight towards the line of six fire elementals. Glaza ride the water elementals worriedly, as mentioned, they would be doing a lot of damage to Olga's fire elementals. The two sides closed on one another and Glaza crossed her arms, shivering at the impending clash. Cavalry, come back in and hit them from behind, Olga shouted. Air elementals, whirlwind, now. A gust of wind rose over the front line, sending dust and debris into the air. Half of the charging undead beasts were swept up and hurled back towards the center of the battlefield, where the skeleton riders were poised to pounce on them. Raoul gaped at the sudden turn of events. Air elementals, Olga ordered, tie up those water elementals. Fire elementals, get rid of those undead beasts in the front. Cavalry, keep your undead beasts mucked up for as long as you can. The fire elementals howled as they set into the undead beasts. After they burned their way through, they went to help the air elementals finish off the water elementals and the skeleton mages casting spells from the back. Olga's skeleton riders didn't last more than a minute against their undead beasts, but it was enough time to buy an insurmountable advantage. Hmm, it's snowing and the kids here are still out and about, an unfamiliar voice said from behind them. Humans sure are raised differently. Reports, I have seen. But. More, intense than described. Glaza turned around. Beside Olga's command tower, a towering ice-blue insectoid stood beside a big black-scaled lizard man with all sorts of scars over his body. Several more insectoids were coming out of Glaza's tree along with a half-dozen additional lizardmen. Glaza frowned as they sorted themselves out, she didn't think she could ever get used to the fact that she was used as a transport corridor. Unexpectedly, Lord Mayor did not come out of the tree behind them. When the dust of the battle settled, the undead servitors came from around the field, ordering themselves into tidy ranks before offering a crisp salute. Glaza and her team watched from the sides. In the distance, Raoul and the boys came running towards them. Lord Kokaitis, one of the elder lich sergeants said, you honor us with your presence. Mm. So, the black-scaled lizardman said, who won? As one, the elder liches turned their heads. Olga stepped forward, looking up with wide eyes before dipping into a curtsy. Olga Lysenko, she said. Um, are you Grand Marshal Kokaitis? I am, the big blue bug nodded. Your victory, congratulations. Olga looked back up again, mouth working silently for a second before her hand came up in a salute. Yes sir. Thank you, sir. Glaza jumped at Olga's sudden shout, but she couldn't blame her for doing so. Grand Marshal Kokaitis was one of the great lords of the Sorceress Kingdom, in charge of all the armies. Even the Warden deferred to him for some reason. Next to the Grand Marshal, the big lizardman rubbed his jaw as he gave Olga an appraising look. Hmm, she doesn't look like a human lord, the lizardman said. Or does she? I guess she's a bit tall, how old are you, kiddo? I turned thirteen last month, Mr. Lizardman. Ho, oh, that means you become an adult next year. Yeah? Do you have a nice boy lined up already? 
Despite all the different species living in the Sorceress Kingdom, sex appeared to be a topic appreciated by most. It didn't even work the same way for everyone but each came away with associations and connotations that meant something to them. The kids around the hillside all gave the lizardman a weird look, sometimes those associations didn't work out so well. We're not adults until we're twenty, Mr. Lizardman. Why is that so? But I thought, Jem, does a different species of human live here? Hob humans? Wood humans? Shazariu. They are, just humans. Religious customs. Different. Oh. The lizardman looked up at the snow coming down from the overcast skies. After a moment, he shivered from head to tail. Anyhow, which way to the lizardman villages? I'm about to freeze my scales off. I'm going there soon, Glaza raised a hand. I can show you the way. Grand Marshal Kokitis regarded her with his multi-eyed gaze. You are, Glaza? Glaza nodded. I see. So, this is, Mares. His grumbly voice trailed off into broken up murmurs. Glaza wasn't sure what any of it meant. Well, thank you for your kind offer, Miss Glaza, Shajariu said. Just lead the way when you're ready.